Okay, Rachel and Kayla, are you ready to go? Okay. Uh, hi, and welcome, everyone. Uh, get my right notes here. <laughs> hi, um, welcome to the second of a pair of webcasts sponsored by the New York State Department of Health and Office of Mental Health and organized by the Institute for Disaster Mental Health at SUNY New Paltz. I'm Carla Vermeulen. I'm the deputy director of IDMH. So today's event is actually the fourth that we've hosted with our same pair of wonderful presenters since the pandemic began. We continue to learn how to cope with our ongoing professional stress from our presenters, Rachel Call and Kayla Seavey from the Department of Health and Human Services Office of the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response. You'd think by the fourth time I would be able to actually say that smoothly, but I don't think I ever will be able to. Um, so Ms. Call is a licensed clinical social worker and the behavioral health lead for the agency. She has extensive background in providing guidance and direction to the behavioral health, public health, and emergency response communities throughout the country on ways to enhance and integrate behavioral health services into preparedness, response, and recovery efforts in order to foster individual community and responder resilience. Ms. Seavey is a behavioral health program analyst for the agency, where she supports behavioral health preparedness, response, and recovery efforts. Her background is in social work, and she has extensive experience in international community development and public health. So last week's session, um, which was titled, How Are You Now? Exploring Emerging Stressors and Evolving Approaches to Coping, focused on strengthening individual functioning um, using some really creative and relevant new approaches. If you missed it, it is absolutely worth watching. Um, it's available on the Institute for Disaster Mental Health YouTube channel, and it will be posted on LMS soon, um, along with a recording of today's webinar as well. So you can look for that and recommend that to friends. So today's topic, titled Building an Organizational Culture of Resilience, Lessons from the Field. We'll explore how leadership teams and organizational systems can build that culture of resilience, which obviously is something that every organization that has been taxed with responding to tremendous demands like the pandemic and all of our other ongoing disasters really seriously need to you know, take into consideration. So we're glad everyone in the audience is with us. I will now turn it over to Rachel Call and Kayla Seavey to share their insights. Thank you, Carla. I appreciate that, uh, that overview and, and intro. So welcome. Thank you all for joining us. Um, we know your time is valuable. So that the fact that you're spending it with us is something mm -hmm. that uh, we're very um, honored by. So thank you for that. So just quickly, as Carla introduced, you sort of know what our backgrounds are, but just to uh, put a context as well as we, Kayla and I have really been working across workforce sectors for the past two and a half years. Um, trying to take a look at how we adapt and cope and or don't with COVID and, and the resulting stressors and conditions. Um, and what we've really tried to do is focus on strategies or approaches that people tell us they are actually implementing. And there's many, many excellent books on organizational resilience and how you can um, you know, adapt to culture change, et cetera. And there, there's a lot of good literature out there. We relied some on that, but we really wanted to focus on what are people really doing? And that's why this presentation is gonna be pretty um, grounded in what people tell us uh, has worked for them or in their organization. So, so that's why we call it lessons from the field. It's, uh, it's kind of real world experience that we've been collecting over the last few months in particular. Uh, as we enter whatever this new normal is. So a couple intro housekeeping things for those of you on the webinar. Um, first of all, Kayla and I use the chat a lot. Um, we like our uh, participants to participate uh, with us. So we'll be asking questions, asking for input in the chat. Please, please definitely do that. Your inputs are as important as anything that we're gonna be presenting here and it helps us sort of shape our um, knowledge of what's resonating for folks, et cetera. Um, we're going to absolutely get to a copy of the slides after the presentation, so no need to worry. Um, in the slides, you're gonna notice as we go through, uh, we hyperlink to actual other resources as well. Anything in blue is a live link. So once you get the slides, you will have access not just to our content, but to additional content that this was built off of. Um, there's gonna be at least one pen to paper kind of exercise. So if you don't already, go ahead and grab a, a pencil or a pen and a piece of paper just so you can jot some things down. 
and you might want to take some notes if you if you are so inclined. Um, we're going to go off camera during our actual presentation. We'll come back on for Q&A at the end. Again, we like to try and leave five or 10 minutes for Q&A at the end. So um, hold your questions that are, you know, if you can. But um, obviously, we'll, we'll try to attend to the chat as well. Um, and with that, Kayla, did I forget anything? No, I think you covered covered everything. But as Rachel said, uh, please, please um, use the chat box. We really do appreciate hearing from all of your experiences. It really helps kind of shape um, shape all of this information and also our understanding of what works for you. Thanks, Rachel. Absolutely. All right. So, and as I said, we're going to be laying out many kind of different strategies that we really look at implementing within the workplace or among the workforce. And hopefully, maybe not everything is going to be something that you can see your organization doing or adapting. Um, but hopefully you'll come away with a few things you hadn't thought about that you could uh, put some attention to or maybe try to implement. So with that, I'm going to go off camera. Kayla, next slide. which is just our disclaimer. Um, you know, we really have put this content together ourselves. We are not intending to represent the views of the U.S. government or the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services in a formal way. Um, and we also want to make sure, you know, that we uh, have tried to make sure that everything that we link to is well evidence-based and supported, uh, but it may not be completely compliant with certain uh, rules and guidelines outlined by the federal government, although we do try very hard to make sure all of our information is accessible. Next slide. Oh, Kayla, I'm actually going to turn it to you. Thanks, Rachel. Um, so I'm actually going to ask you a chat box question. So if you don't have the chat box open, um, I encourage you to open it now. Um, I'm curious, can you all type in your organization or the workforce sector that you work in and are you virtual hybrid or in person give a give a minute for you to type that in so it's two things organization or workforce sector and are you in person virtual or hybrid Okay, I'm seeing a lot of responses in the chat. This is great. And I'm seeing a mix, a fair amount of in-person as well as virtual, um, a couple hybrid responses as well. It looks like mostly hybrid when you look at it, but there are some folks who are 100% in person and some folks who are still virtual, it looks like. We have a nice mix of uh, a professions here as well. So that's going to be helpful to us. All right. Well, thank you all for uh, engaging with us via the chat. We will be continuing to ask questions. So make sure to keep keep the chat box open and readily accessible. So quick recap from our previous presentation that really focused on organizational and kind of team strategies. Um, back in early 2021, when we were talking about organizational and team resilient strategies, we really looked at how do we make meaning, um, especially when there's ongoing stress and stressors while also really looking forward to not just where are we now but also where are we going and how can we continue kind of making making meaning in that context. Um, and I have included, we've included the recording as well as some of the key resources we highlighted uh, during that presentation. And these are all hyperlinked if you're interested uh, in exploring these afterwards. Um, but today's webinar, as Rachel said, will really explore additional strategies and approaches that are resonating within workforces, organizations, and teams now. And we're gonna ask you another chat box question. So to get us kind of started and, and thinking about this organizational and workforce lens, we have two statements. Um, and I'm gonna ask that you kind of think about this statement. So the first one is, 
My workforce sector has shrunk significantly in the past 10 years. And we have a kind of a sliding scale of going from strongly disagree to strongly agree. And I'm, I'm seeing people catching on in the chat. I'm going to ask that you put the letter of the one that kind of you would put yourself in. All right, there's a lot of lot of letters. Uh, Rachel, can you can you help me? There's yeah, I can. It's, it's interesting because we really run the gamut, which I think is is uh, may reflect the kind of workforce you're in. Um, there are, you know, we did get some really disagrees and strongly disagrees. Um, a few neutral, but but and then the other heavy heavy weight was towards agree. So, um, you know, I think that's interesting. I think that may be a, a, a factor of kind of where do you work? Um, and is is that a sector that has experienced uh, um, some decline in staffing or staffing shortages or not. So we'll, we'll, we'll go into that in another minute, but, but we're definitely seeing across the gamut here, Kayla. Mm -hmm. Okay, so statement two, we're gonna do the same thing. Um, I am concerned about workforce retention within my sector. Where would you put yourself in this? Strongly disagree disagree, neither agree nor disagree, agree. This is de yeah, this is definitely trending to, to agree here in terms of people being concerned. And, and I just, Kayla, wanted to reflect that somebody had said, you know, maybe if the question was framed more recently, not the last 10 years, but maybe, you know, the last three years, last two years, the answers might be a little bit different. So that's, that's, a, that's a nice um, reminder for us as well. That is a really nice reflection. All right, so before we move on to kind of the, the data slide, Rachel, do you have any additional comments or reflections based on the chat? Well, I think we're going to want to talk a little bit more about um, kind of workforce retention and workforce recruitment uh, are kind of the two big, big issues right now that organizations that we're talking to are certainly concerned about. And there's a few reasons for that. Next slide. Um, first of all, we do have some data that does show that, um, you know, state and local employees uh, are saying they're thinking about changing jobs, a third of them, uh, which actually was kind of lower than I thought, but a third of them are saying they might want to do that. Uh, the public health workforce has been shrinking anyway, and that's kind of why we asked that question about the last 10 years is because we do know um, just from data and um, surveys that have been conducted in the last year or two that the public health and healthcare workforce are really starting to experience um, higher levels of people leaving the leaving their jobs. Uh, but this is on top of a sector that was already in decline, and that is of huge concern as uh, as uh, our public health workforce uh, is so imperative to not just responding to different kinds of public health emergencies and events, but also in prevention. Uh, so we're just going to, we just have fewer of that asset right now. Um, and then the openings and turnover report shows us that almost 70% of separations were actually people quitting. It wasn't people retiring. Um, it wasn't, you know, people who, uh, you know, perhaps died while they were still uh, employed. It was potentially quitting. And that is of huge concern. Um, and, you know, in some ways, I wonder what what is that about? And, and if anybody has a thought on, like, why are so many people quitting right now? Where does your head go when when I ask that question? What do, what do you think um, is a potential just one of many probably potential factors? Um, and go ahead and put in the chat if you have it. And so I'm seeing yeah, frustration. Um, Child care issues. I would also say elder care issues for that, um, loss of meaning, and, and people sort of are expressing a loss of drive, um, less motivation, um, being overextended, not being well resourced, uh, short staffed, uh, burnt out. There's other, you know, a couple people who are saying, hey, you know, there's better paying jobs in some circumstances that are causing people to jump to other other places. And that's not necessarily a negative reason to quit, but it certainly is impacting 
certain kinds of uh, environments poorly. So, and I think it, it, the, things are more complicated. Clients are more complicated. I think the work is complicated depending on where you are, uh, but there is that fatigue, that burnout, that lack of motivation. Do we still have meaning? So I want, I, I just want to kind of ground there for a second because what we really are want to, going to try and convey and go through here are strategies that sort of are really about how we show up at work. It's not strategies that, that only leadership or organizational top uh, should or could be responsible for. We, we certainly want leadership engaged in building up the resilience uh, and the well-being of their work force. But it's sort of, it's really about, hey, how do we show up at work? How do we show up to our co-workers in ways that help us build a bigger culture um, that's going to allow us to want to thrive in the environment we're in, that's going to combat those feelings of burnout, that's going to help us connect to meaning. Um, and to and to help us kind of share the load so that we're not feeling quite as overextended. So this is, these are some of the things I want you to think about as we go forward. It's really about how are we all doing this. Um, Kayla, I'm going to turn this to the next slide, if you don't mind. So in just to kind of put a frame around organizational stress and burnout. I like to kind of use this slide because when we think about stress, we think about how people describe their experience of stress. And it's sort of that, you know, column on the left where, um, you know, people are emotionally reactive. They may have physiological symptoms of stress. Um, often they have cognitive sort of challenges. Um, one thing that I often see in organizations that are under stress or people are kind of almost over engaged, they, it's like the on button has gotten flipped up and they don't know how to turn it off anymore. They uh, are just, uh, you know, working all the time, late hours, don't take any time off because they just are so um, overstimulated by uh, the demands that that are upon them. But then burnout kind of shows up a little bit differently and it shows up kind of almost like everything just getting a little duller. Um, disengagement is a bigger sign of burnout. Uh, and, and there's an emotional component because when you're burnt out, one tends to be less engaged in the work and less effective at the work. Um, and therefore that can also start to shift confidence level. So what we really look at is uh, when people are describing a burnt out organization or a workforce that is burnt out, we want to think about, so what's the alignment between their people in the work setting? Um, generally, burnout uh, occurs when there's a misalignment between things like workload, um, resources, there's a, a feeling of inequity with these things. People feel like they've lost their locus of control over how they do their work. Uh, or what the impacts are, um, the, the sense of reward for effort do not seem to be um, uh, relatable. Um, uh, maybe the sense of community, there just feels like this is not no longer contributing to my sense of community within the workplace or even outside of it. Fairness and then of course values. Do Am I able to uh, really rely on my values and what I think is important and prioritize? And does that get reflected in the work that I do or the tasks that I'm uh, assigned? And if not, how do I pull those two things closer together? So that's kind of what we think about when we're thinking about organizational stress and burnout. Um, Kayla? You know, I'm, I'm looking through the chat and it's, it's interesting kind of seeing these examples of what misalignment can look like um, and how this how this can be reflected with retention concerns as well and kind of going in the same vein almost when we were thinking about workplace stress and burnout and these these stressors that can can impact organizations and, and workforces uh, we also have to think about how stress is showing up within the workplace. And we've listed a couple examples of things that we've been hearing a lot from our various stakeholders. And I'm curious in the chat if there are any here that are really resonating with people or if there are additional examples of how stress shows up within your organization or maybe something you've heard or seen in other spaces. 
So for example, like here we see interpersonal conflict. Um, this can show up through like gossiping or, mm -hmm. or that tension, that verbal tension. I'm seeing in the chat, yeah, communication gaps or lags with leadership or just um, a, a missing, missing communication link. Procrastination and lack of motivation is showing up in the chat as well. And I'm happy to see that for some of you, um, these aren't resonating, that you're, you're working in a very supportive environment, which is fantastic to hear. Formation of clicks, which can tie into that gossip piece. Um, and then we can also see if we're looking at the examples on the slide uh, these can impact productivity um, as well as just learning curve in general to get deliverables done. So it can yeah. impact operations. Um, Rachel, is there anything I'm missing in the chat? I think uh, people have put in really good examples that align with this. And some people have said they're in a supportive place, as you mentioned, which is great. So we'll want to hear kind of um, what you're doing in your place to, uh, to sort of have that kind of an environment. Um, or how you build, hold on to it, and how you continue to build it. Um, I also think a couple of people have mentioned you just notice people kind of calling in sick more often. In hybrid environments, one of the things I notice, and and we've talked about this on our own team, is people when they show up um, for sort of uh, virtual meetings don't want to go on camera anymore. That's actually a really significant sign uh, if people aren't willing to go on camera at all. So it's one thing to be on camera for an entire meeting, but when you're running meetings where everybody's just a name on a screen, um, you have to think about what kind of community that is really creating or how it's impacting a sense of the collective. Uh, so I just wanted to mention that. Thanks, Kayla. Yeah, but I also see in the chat um, like shifts in how much you disclose to your colleagues as well. So like your personal life, that that can be, um, a sign of, of stress showing up. So we have these, these examples, both in the chat and on the screen of how stress shows up. And we also want to consider and think about when it's left unaddressed, what are some of those adverse conditions that can show up within the workplace and within organizations and teams, um, ranging from, as, as Rachel mentioned, burnout, uh, turnover, um, as well as performance decline overall. But there are also implications for financial and legal spaces, which, um, Rachel, I'm not sure if you'd like to, to unpack that a little bit more. Well, I know that one of the ways that our leadership has really started to think about how you make the business case for some uh, enhanced or increased or kind of out of the box uh, approaches to, to supporting the workforce is really, because if we fail to do that, um, we do face potential legal implications, um, EEO complaints, uh, disruptions among people that can lead to, um, or labor, labor relational complaints, and then financial implications for people who are potentially going on workers comp, um, or they're not at work, right? They're there, and so the productivity or the mission goes down anyway, and that that at the end of the day costs money. So what we try to do is, you know, appeal to leadership uh, and to organizations as a whole to say, hey, we really want to support each other, and 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 people in general do want to do that. But if it just feels like that's a bridge too far, or we don't have the time or the resources for that. Um, we also want to make sure people understand that that actually you're risking far more financially, legally, et cetera, if you don't address this. So it's, it's sort of just giving them two different um, ways to be inspired and encouraged to to really take the well-being and the and the um, culture of the workforce, that that supportive culture um, to take that as a priority uh, going forward. Thanks, Kayla. Next slide. So, but for the fun part, I just wanted to say that we 
are going to be talking as we go through strategies. Some of these are things that we heard directly from people that have been in our trainings uh, or have you know, sat in a classroom with us and said, this is what we did. So we call those our strategies from the field and those are our representatives in the field <laughs> who are gonna be sharing those with us. And uh, I happen to like cows, so you'll have to, you'll have to um, blame me for, that, for the cow mot motif here. Um, but we'll be doing that throughout just here and there, as well as, as framing some more um, formal strategies. So with that in mind, Kayla, next slide. So the frame we're going to put around organizational resilience strategies is sort of an ABC, right? Um, a being the first piece of a, a culture of resilience is really awareness. And that means an awareness of where your workforce is now, how they're doing, uh, maybe what the history of the workforce or the organization has been or the agency so that you have a sense of where they've come from and where are they now uh, and what kinds of approaches have been taken in the past. Uh, maybe what's been implemented didn't quite stick or what was something that you used to do that uh, it just got, you know, got away from you. Uh, so that awareness is that first piece. We're very big on, on sort of figuring out self-assessment um, of an organization. The next is B is balance. And by balance, we mean sort of that feeling of um, that push pull of the demand versus the reward, um, the personal versus the professional, uh, understanding boundaries. Uh, boundaries have gotten very complex in hybrid environments and virtual environments. Um, you know, we're all in each other's living rooms and offices and, you know, kitchen tables, depending on, uh, on where you take your virtual calls. Uh, if you are virtual, there's also kind of a, a boundary uh, in terms of services available. People have mentioned things like child care, elder care, even pet care, right? Um, it's, it's actually the, the things we used to rely on to sort of create structure at home and then at work. Some of those have become far more difficult uh, to engage consistently, uh, particularly as we're still in, in a time when if you're testing, testing regularly and often and you do test positive for COVID, it, it sort of shuts everything down, right? You have to not participate, not send your kid, not come to work. It's, it's, uh, it's a complicated time. So creating balance is a really important approach. And we'll talk about some of those strategies. And then the last thing being connections. Connections not being last and least, but being uh, sort of the foundation of everything, right? How do we um, continue to create support systems? How do we ensure that communication is effective, not just to leadership, but from leadership and then across teams, across our workforce? Uh, and are we able to um, connect uh, ourselves and, and each other to kind of the, the resources we need um, when we feel like things are getting a little overwhelming. So, so this, is, this is kind of our frame for the organizational resilience strategies. It's going to be an A, a B, and a C. Kayla? Okay, so we are getting started with A, which is awareness. Um, and if you joined us last week for the individual webinar, you may remember that we actually talked about intentional tracking uh, from that individual lens. Um, but today, what we're talking about is really intentional tracking and assessment through an organizational and workforce lens. Um, and this can be, it can be formal, it can be informal um, and if we're thinking about informal, so for informal strategies, this can be encouraging and modeling tracking tools. So we've included some apps as examples, and these are as evidence informed, and we're, we've been hearing really positive feedback on these apps specifically. Um, and I mean, this can be leadership sending um, sending out resources or informal leadership sending out resources that may include things like apps. Another tool that we mentioned last week is a leave tracker. So if your organization or workplace has annual leave, you can share or encourage leadership to share tracking tools um, as really a method to periodically double check hours 
um, but also as a staff reminder to take leave and plan for leave. So really kind of having that dual purpose um, as a tool if this is applicable in your workspace. On the formal side though, there are really kind of two areas we wanted to highlight here. Uh, first is using assessments and surveys. And I, I'm curious uh, in the chat with a yes or no, in the past, let's say year, has your organization sent out a workforce assessment or maybe a wellness or well-being assessment? Yes or no? So Kayla, it's interesting because we're certainly, some folks have definitely had some workforce assessments. A lot of folks are saying no, more, more, I mean, it's a, it's, it's not surprising so much as it's notable in that taking a temperature on how your folks are doing now uh, as an organization, um, it, it's, it's important. So you sort of know what to do with that. Uh, and, and those, those kinds of, there's, there's a lot of surveys out there. There's a lot of different kinds of um, ways of, of, um, of developing or designing those, including ways to make them um, confidential if, uh, uh, or anonymous if, if that is, is part of what's necessary. Um, they can be doing focus groups, uh, taking kind of a sampling of, of different folks and having them kind of share how they think folks are doing. Um, we had a, a very nice survey that, that our agency put out that at the end of it also gave resources um, once it sort of identified, okay, so how are you doing? Um, and in the different domains of stress and resilience, it would give resources linked to that. So um, there are some areas that are working on this. And if yours is not one of them, it's something you might want to consider just how, how do you take the pulse of how people are doing? Um, and then, uh, you know, because in that way, how can you then design what you're going to do next uh, based on what people are really telling you uh, is important to them and what they need? So I, th I think it's, a, it's an important exercise to go through right now as we transition uh, into this next phase of, of whatever the pandemic and, and, and the, the state of the world is going to bring us. Um, thanks, Kayla. Yeah, this is, this is really interesting. Um, and if your organization or workforce is, is thinking about or interested in kind of developing this, I have, we have included some of the scales and assessments. Um, that are included within the apps on the right uh, that are really great places to start looking as well as kind of resources of, of how how do these type of assessments look like um, and and what might that what might that be so our, our second key area for a formal approach is really thinking about your performance evaluation process and potentially integrating workforce well-being components or exploring tools like an individual development plan. So, and this will vary from agency to agency based on your organization and what your performance review process looks like, what that entails and what types of flexibilities are allowable within that. Um, but this can be kind of adding in or kind of reassessing um, goals outlined, I know uh, Rachel and I are at the time time of the year where we're doing our mid year review. Uh, so this is a really great time to kind of think about, okay, how are we doing kind of take that pulse that awareness piece, um, but also see if there's if there's space to kind of think about strategically um, wellness and and just organizational well being within within our area and our organization. Um, so we are going to go a little bit more in depth into the professional growth piece um, and kind of walk through an individual development plan. Um, but I'm, I'm curious, we're going to do another yes or no. Has anyone in, um, have you done or kind of walked through or maybe completed an individual development plan within your organization? Like, is this something that that you've heard about before or seen.
Okay, I'm seeing I'm seeing a mix, but a lot of no's. A couple no, but one to two. There seems to be some interest. Okay, so we have linked in an example of what this can look like, and just just so we're on the same page, we've kind of in, we've included like a snapshot. It's um, it doesn't look a, like very uh it's it, it looks a little rough the text is really small um so i encourage you to look at this look at this afterwards if you're if you're interested but this is an example of what an individual development plan can look like but the caveat here is that there are things that we need to consider when making an individual development plan um, or if you're encouraging this within a workplace so we're gonna walk through that and I'm gonna ask that you grab your piece of paper and a writing utensil. So when we're thinking about an individual development plan, there are certain considerations we need to think about and walk through. And I'm gonna ask that you look at these questions and jot down your responses for this. And I'm gonna put Rachel on the spot as an example for this. So I love being an example. <laughs> <laughs> what skill or learning opportunity would you like to accomplish within the next year? So one of the things I'd really like to do is delve a little bit more into reflective supervision, which is a style of supervision that um, really um, relies on dialogue and sort of updated communication on a regular basis with the folks that you supervise uh, and really holds the supervisor accountable for making sure that, hey, am I really hearing what the needs are here? Uh, are we achieving what we agreed to achieve together? Am I providing the support or the resources I said I would? So. Uh, it's, it's a theory I know about and I've read about, but I'd actually like to delve into that and start kind of mindfully uh, practicing this. Okay, so for reflective supervision, what are some of the steps that you can take? Like, how would you break that down? Sure. Well, there's certainly some online training that goes beyond the, um, you know, just sort of the concept model. Um, but then I'd also want to uh, engage my supervisees, uh, sit down and let them know I'm really trying to uh, create this as a skill and as an approach to supervision um, and sort of determine with them how they can provide me the feedback I need so that I know that uh, um, I'm, I'm either progressing uh, or, uh, or I need sort of more support and super supervision myself and how to do this. Okay, uh, so follow up question. What do you need to accomplish this? So what are some of the supports? Are there resources that you need in order to kind of meet this goal? I think the main support I need beyond what I've already described is also to make sure that my supervisory chain uh, is willing to give me the space or the time to do this and to discuss it in my own meetings with them. I think sometimes we get to a certain point in our careers, our jobs, our our uh, teams that we sort of stop talking about how we can improve or what we'd like to be doing better and sort of eliciting feedback from others who work with us. So that's gonna be an important piece for me. Well, and I think you bring up a really important component of this when we're coming up with something like an individual development plan, it's great to have like, okay, what do you want to accomplish? But then really unpacking what are the key steps and the resources and supports needed uh, to ensure that it is actually feasible within your workplace and within your organization. So I'm gonna give another minute for folks to kind of jot down and, and really think about it. Like if, if you had the form that was on the slide previously, um, if you had this form in your hand and you were, you were filling it out, what are some of, some of the things that you would pick? whether it's a learning opportunity, like a training, um, or a skill that you're looking to develop. You know, and I think um, 
um, Kayla too, that revisiting this plan to be accountable to it, both yourself and, and with others so that you can kind of see, are you on track or not? Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I like uh, building a uh, building a freelance uh, business and coming up with that business plan, um, and uh, and yeah, and you have your time frame, so that's great. That's mm -hmm. just great. And and I also want to say, in an individual development plan, that we're even if we're forming this at work, um, I always like to try and build in something that's not necessarily super professional related. It might be more personal, right? It could be something that really aligns more with wellness or um, just my intellectual growth. It could be, you know what, I want to read a novel a month. I mean, I think these plans need to reflect that um, in order for us to feel like we have growth potential and to maintain that kind of creativity, we sort of need uh, to, to, to think about different areas of our life and where do we really want to put our energy. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Kayla. Yeah, I appreciate that. And I appreciate the comments in the chat. Oh, my goodness. It's an it's a strategy from the field coming to us from the field. These are things that literally people I I'm the pictures just make me smile um, that people have literally told us, you know, was important to them and made a difference for them, particularly uh, during very uh, challenging times of the pandemic. And one is something we just already talked about. It's, but it's, it's one thing to say, hey, here's how you build, you know, uh, an individual development plan. It's another thing for the workplace, the team, the organization to allow opportunities for that. Um, it doesn't necessarily just happen organically. So is there space? And, you know, as Kayla had mentioned, we, I really like to use the performance uh, review process that we have to make that space. Um, and there's other, um, you know, one-on-one -on -one supervision or team meetings, or maybe you have quarterly retreats or planning days. Uh, but can you, can you carve out time uh, that really allows the space for people to think about opportunities and areas that they want to develop? Uh, that's, that's the big important piece, that that space doesn't exist because we're all too busy doing our work. Um, to stop and think for a minute, um, then people don't tend to don't tend to find that they can do it. Um, another strategy is uh, called setting up a quiet room, and this is one that came to us from folks at uh, USA Idea Department of State. And at their overseas, and, and all of their office buildings, but particularly at their overseas missions, they have a space they set up, and it's its own area that's quiet low lit, there's no screens, there's no computers, uh, there may be a noise canceling machine, uh, comfortable seating, and just a place where people can remove themselves from the stimulant, right? If they need to, just for a few minutes, just to take a few minutes, maybe get away from colleagues, uh, get away from customers, just get away for, for a few minutes, have some quiet time. Maybe that time is just spent sort of sitting in reflection, maybe there's mo meditation, maybe deep breathing, um, you know, maybe paging through a magazine, anything, it, you know, there's no rule to it, but having that space and not just having the space, but having the cultural understanding that people can use that space um, is uh, really helpful and something, particularly when people were working long shifts during the pandemic, uh, I know uh, a lot of hospitals were setting up areas, sort of respite areas like that, um, et cetera. Um, Kayla, I know you had something on this as well. Yeah, so I, I think it's also important here, just reflecting on at the beginning, many many of you are, are hybrid or virtual, uh, but there are components of kind of this quiet room strategy that can be integrated with within that. So whether that's organizationally setting up times where meetings are not scheduled um, or kind of normalizing, uh, like even just 12 to one for, for lunchtime and kind of creating those spaces. And then you can encourage individuals to engage in, in, in some of the activities that Rachel mentioned might be within kind of a quiet room setup. So there are still ways to integrate components of, of kind of an in-person strategy within a virtual space. 
Thanks, Rachel. Sure. So we'll come, we'll come back to strategies from the field at another point. So now we're going to head over to the B. Uh, we're going to head over to balance. And one of those things and we really feel is that workforce has emphasized to us that trust, trust across the workforce, across coworkers and colleagues, trust with leadership, trust of leadership of their, of their organization and their staff. These, this is an important, important component to sort of fostering overall well-being, revitalizing motivation, et cetera. So I'm curious, um, how does your organization build trust? Like if you thought about how, this is how we do it, or this is how I've seen it done. If, if, if you're in a, in a place where it's not, it's not really happening right now, what are some things that help build trust in an organization? Um, just go ahead and put your answer in the chat. We'd like to, to hear what you think about that. And yep, honesty, working together. Yeah, working together. Transparency is very important. Transparency for everybody. Um, feeling included uh, in decision making, predictability. Um, I see things like kindness, uh, icebreakers. We're going to be talking about that. Also, keeping each other accountable. So there's some of these are sort of soft and 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 supportive, and other of these are like, hey, we really need some boundaries here too. We need to hold each other accountable. We need some predictability. Um, we need to uh, acknowledge what's happening. I think another piece is um, uh, for us, it's, it's like when you hold a meeting or you're going to be uh, at a meeting or, or, or engaging with somebody, you show up, right? You, you actually show up when you say you will, you start things on time, you end things on time. These are things that build trust. Um, it's that unpredictability, that lack of inclusion, um, feeling like everyone's sort of out for themselves. Those are things that break trust in an organization. I think we know. So um, I think really uh, this is something about how do we all come together to build that trust. It's every single one of us is, is engaging in behavior. So, you know, and you've mentioned some of these things, you know, building in fun is actually a way for people to just feel a little lighter, feel like they know each other a little better. Um, and, uh, and play is a very, very uh, effective strategy for overall motivation, even when the work is hard. Um, using existing meetings to do that, you don't necessarily have to set aside a field day. You could, but you don't necessarily have to do that. You can use existing meetings, uh, fold in things like icebreakers or short-term contests like Agency trivia, you know, every day a different trivia question and at the end of a week or at the end of two weeks, you know, who's won the trivia questions, uh, you know, and have, have just minor small prizes and recognition for that. Um, those are fun um, scavenger hunts that can be, whether it's in a, a place or just online, uh, there's, there's a lot of different ways to, to build those and they don't have to take a long time. And as I said, some things can sort of be done over a, over a, a span, over a period. Um, maybe even something like a, a fitness competition, like a friendly competition, uh, where people log their steps or how many days they, they've been able to, to do the exercise that they committed to do or um, avoided caffeine or just something uh, that, uh, the group can together do over time to, to feel connected and to, to in, in, inject some fun into things, starting a book club. That's a very nice idea and sharing books or recipes even. Um, and of course there's a lot of research that's been done, uh, around resilience that shows that on the job buddies, uh, is a really important buddy, the buddy system, whether you have a formal kind of mentor buddy program, or you do it kind of informally. Um, buddies on the job, recognizing that people need to have uh, others to go to, to um, unpack some of the feelings they're having, do a reality check on their impressions of why things are, aren't happening, get feedback themselves, or just get that listening ear. Um, the, on, uh, the Deloitte link will take you to some suggestions on how to foster that kind of an approach. And then, of course, formal mentorship programs. OPM has some nice material on that. 
Um, I think one of the things we've heard from the pandemic is a lot of folks have had to bring people on board and into their agency without kind of the, the usual onboarding orientation opportunities to spend time together. And so the learning curve is different for those people and their ability to sort of identify folks that they'd like to uh, kind of shadow or, or be kind of informal mentors, those opportunities are limited in some cases. So thinking about does your agency, given your workforce, given what's happening, would it benefit from starting a mentor program and really making sure less seasoned staff are connected to people with more seasoning and experience? Um, thinking about those kinds of approaches helps build trust overall. Next slide, Kayla. And then as leaders or supervisors or even informal leaders, you don't have to necessarily have the big, the big L on your t-shirt <laughs> to be a leader in an organization. Uh, but it is important for those who are identified as responsible for things to be visible. I think some of you have mentioned, uh, you know, your managers actually visiting when there's kind of multiple sites or people are spread out, uh, making sure that they show up, that they're, that they're visible, reachable, uh, even when they're busy, there's still kind of opportunities for interaction, whether that's having sort of open office hours or regular check-ins. And those check-ins don't even have to be weekly, depending on the size of your staff. Uh, what we found is staff is happy if they just know they get one on a regular basis. Our, our supervisor, division director, talks to each of us about once a month. We get a one-on-one -on -one with him. Uh, but we know that's coming and you can hold on to a lot of stuff and check in on things and just feel confident that if you have concerns or needs, there's going to be an opportunity. Um, I also wanted to say uh, in terms of the open door, open office hours, I've always really liked the walk around if you can do it. Um, so instead, so go visit and walk around and, and talk to people where they are as opposed to expecting them to get up from what they're doing or come from wherever they are and come to you. You can do a balance of both, but I, I really think uh, being more uh, reachable for others uh, in their space is, is pretty powerful in terms of building trust. Um, I like having a meal together. Yep, we'll talk about some of that too, uh, a little bit further down. When uh, one of these, the second bullet when I'm talking about addressing misalignment between formal and informal conversations, um, I think as colleagues and as leaders, we need to pay attention to what people say privately versus what they say publicly. And when that doesn't align, right? If, if I'm willing to, to, address, to express concerns, complaints, uh, grievances only in private and, and sort of in public, I come across completely differently. Uh, people see that uh, and, and it, it can create sort of a, a tension in a team. So it's a good idea to just ask about it. Say, you know, when, when we talked yesterday, you were really critical of uh, this decision that one of our colleagues made, but, yet, but during the team meeting, you, know, you were saying, oh, that sounds great. And that just helped me understand that, right? Um, and have some conversations so that people understand how to make sure uh, what they're saying publicly and what they're saying privately are as aligned as they can be and as, as appropriate. Um, my biggest thing with building trust as leaders is role model. What you role model it tells your staff and tells your colleagues what you value and what you value for them as well, right? So if I take vacation and take personal time sometimes, I am role modeling that I, I consider that kind of activity important and I want you guys to do it too. Um, different kinds of personal care. Am I, you know, am I getting my primary you know, physician checkups? Am I going to the dentist? Am I, you know, um, and, you know, taking care of those things that kind of make our personal life easier and more effective and our health more effective? I value that too. So I'm trying to role model that. And by respect for personal time, it means I'm not going to send you an email at 11 o'clock at night if I don't need an answer to something at 11 o'clock at night. Um, I'm, I may be on my computer doing something, but if something occurs to me, I can just write an email and save it in drafts and send it in the morning because I want to show that I respect the fact that when you're not at work or you're not online, I expect you to be not online, right? So showing that is really, really important and sort of identifying the behaviors around uh, what demonstrates that respect and what may not, uh, even if that's not your intention. 
Uh, and then we've already talked about opportunities for fun. But you know, somebody just mentioned, hey, we have a monthly birthday party. I think that's a great thing. I also have been in organizations where it's very rare that the leadership shows up for the fun stuff because they're busy, right? So they'll come for the content part of a meeting, but they may not stay or they may not show up for the birthday party. Uh, so as a leader, I think it really says a lot when you show up for the opportunities for fun in the same way you'd show up for the opportunities for serious work. And that's really about participation and engagement. So it's it's kind of you're really walking the walk and talking the talk um, that and showing, hey, this is what I want work to be like, even when it's stressful, even when we got a lot going on. Uh, I want to come in with energy. I want to come in feeling like there's still going to be chances for, for fun and connection and, and getting together on things. So as leaders and as people who may be just seen as leaders based on who we are, this is very important, I think. Next slide. And then meaningful recognition. Uh, we're heading into connection now. And I have a question. How does your workplace recognize or incentivize you? Do you get bonuses? Are there awards? What is the typical, just, just give me in the chat some examples of how, how your workplace might recognize or incentivize you. Because what we found is not everybody is incentivized by the same things, right? Um, so, and some workforce, workplaces just don't really have, they haven't really thought about strategies to do this. Uh, and the reason we call this meaningful recognition is because it's got to be meaningful to the people uh, that are working there. And that means for some people, a certificate of appreciation may be signed by maybe the agency head is a great thing. Um, but for other people, that's kind of meaningless. I don't need that. Uh, bonuses, special parking space. Oh, I like that one. Uh, I'm, I'm going to steal that maybe for, for our agency. <laughs> but, but some sort of a, a, a privilege that could be you know, given given to different people, you know, for two week periods or whatever, so that everybody has a shot at it. But when you have it, it's it's a nice recognition. Um, verbal good jobs are 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 can be can be useful. Um, wage increases. We get uh, sometimes time off awards when something extreme happens, uh, so we can talk about that. But you can see people have different uh, things in their agencies, and that's fine. Uh, but really thinking about how could you do better at recognizing and incentivizing staff? Because what we do know is that has a direct impact on well-being and motivation. Um, so you can do symbolic awards. It doesn't have to cost money. You can do uh, that kind of public recognition of, you know, something that someone did um, at the beginning of a meeting or in an email. Uh, you can do, obviously, certificates that are fun and, and reflect kind of what the contribution was personalized emails. It doesn't necessarily have to be a public recognition. It can just be taking the time once a week to personally send something out so people know that you're paying attention and that you care. Um, I had a manager who uh, this last one time off, he had these little coupons and legally we could give out, a manager can give out 59 minutes. You can leave, you can give somebody 59 minutes, let them release them 59 minutes every now and then. Often we do that before a holiday. But he would have these 59 minute coupons and he'd hand them out, like not to everybody. He'd come in and say, I've been really appreciating your inputs lately. Here's a 59 minute coupon. You can use it whenever you want. So I would have this coupon that one day I could say, I'm leaving 59 minutes early. And it just felt really good. Um, and he was able to do it. It's totally legal. And they got way more than 40 hours out of me. So giving me 59 minutes is not that big a deal, but it made me feel good. So I really recommend think about those kinds of things. Next slide. And keep in mind, there's some factors to this, right? Um, just when you're giving recognition, people find it meaningful based on who the messenger is, what the timing is, and what the details of it are, right? They, they care about these things. So, you know, kind of reflect on those things. Who, who, who do people really want to hear from? Uh, that they're doing a good job or their efforts are appreciated. And um, is it done in a way where uh, people feel like, yeah, this is this is right time, right place. This is good. Um, consider you don't necessarily have to do public recognition. You can also um, 
uh, do that private recognition. Kayla had a good example where someone she knows has an email folder. When someone writes her something nice and says, thank you, or that was great, or you're awesome. She has, she has this self appreciation folder, right? That those nice emails go to one place so that she can just reflect and refer to them on days when maybe she's not feeling so great about you know, everything that's going on. And I think that's a really nice idea to sort of have a trove of, of the positive comments to remind you when things are a little harder. And whenever you're giving recognition, remember that equity is always an issue because, um, you know, there's, there's also the, the stumbling block I see some managers on when uh, they say, well, I'm giving everybody an award and, because that's equitable. But an, an award where you're giving everybody the award doesn't necessarily feel that meaningful, right? Particularly because everybody's not equal in terms of the effort they put into something, right? It, it depends. So you want to make sure you're not over committing to certain groups or uh, people who've maybe gotten uh, more access to opportunities than others. You want to really pay attention to that lens, but also be careful about going too far the other direction and just sort of making any kind of congratulation or award um, just kind of meaningless because everybody gets it no matter what they did or didn't do. So those are just things to consider. And that Harvard Business Review article that we linked to uh, in the past is, um, is also going to give you some suggestions. Next slide, Kayla. Another coming to you from the field, and this is, we've already talked about some of this stuff, but um, in terms of public recognition, is there a place in your agency or even maybe on your uh, virtual workspace where they can be sort of a caught in the good act message board when people can say, hey, Mark did something really terrific this morning. Um, you know, just wanted to give him a shout out or kudos to team B because of their uh, finishing the budget submission. Just just caught in a good act message board uh, that people can see. Um, the gratitude greeting cards is actually something that uh, a couple of people have mentioned, and we've done this at Asper where we have blank kind of thank you or you're terrific or um, I appreciate you. Um, so we have these in sort of card holders around the building so that you can, as you're walking by, think about it. You can take one and you can write a private message to somebody. It sort of um, gives you that, uh, that um uh, reminder that, hey, you know, I really wanted to tell Mara what a great job she did. You can write a personal note and having those kind of available and accessible. They're very nice to get. They always cheered me right up and I have them all in a folder like uh, like we talked about. Kaylee, did you have anything you wanted to add here? I would just add for the for kind of this uh, gratitude greeting cards. We've also seen this uh, virtually through like um, I'm and Rachel, I'm blanking on the name of it, but you can do those kind of shared cards. Uh, oh, that kudo, the Kudos yeah, website. Well. That was a yeah. good one. A kudogram. Yeah, we'll 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 put that. We'll uh, we'll we'll pull that up and, and include that uh, when we put out the slides. And another thing with connection that I want to talk about is um, kind of peer support. We talked about a buddy system. Um, you can have a formal peer support network. You can have an informal one. Our disaster medical group has uh, their own Facebook page uh, and they've got several groups based on what their specialty is and they share information they share pictures from their deployments. They stay in contact uh, and they really point to it as something that really sustains them particularly through difficult deployments or following difficult deployments. Um, so you can set up informal listservs, links, you know, places in your shared office space uh, where folks can um, kind of engage in, in creating those kinds of communities. There's more formal peer support networks as well. Just wanted to uh, bring your awareness to something you may or may not be aware of. The Disaster Distress Helpline is establishing online peer support communities. Those peer support communities, there's three um, right now. Uh, healthcare workers impacted by COVID is one of them. Another one is parents and caregivers impacted by COVID. And then one that is standing up right now is for survivors of mass violence. And these are Facebook groups. They're private groups. You um, get invited to join when you send a request. They are monitored by trained peer supporters uh, and folks who are um, capable of providing immediate crisis counseling or support if that's needed. Uh, but it gives 
folks an opportunity to kind of share their experiences as well as resources and and often more often than not um, sort of the positive stories around how they managed um, to adjust to, to difficult situations. So um, I really recommend no matter where you work, um, clicking on that online peer support community and see what the disaster distress helpline is doing. And you may find that you or some of your peers or people you know would benefit from joining. Thanks, Kayla. Next slide. So we went kind of through the ABC, but now it's like, okay, we've got all these tools in the toolbox. You know, I think part of what we're trying to also recommend is you think about what's already there uh, and what you might want to add. Uh, and then there's kind of one thing we're sort of like, what's one skill we sort of want everybody to have to just feel like they could effectively support and help their colleagues, coworkers, uh, supervisees, et cetera. So, and what's one basic kind of primary prevention skill? So we're going to go into that. Next slide. But first, we have another coming to you from the field. Um, many people mention things like taking a break and getting outside, taking walks, doing brief hikes, walking around the block with a group of people, uh, showing up at work a little early to do that. We I, that was that came up many many times, and I think a couple people here had mentioned things like birthday parties. Um, cake was was one that came up uh, in one of our things and just that cake <laughs> okay cake is a good thing but yeah opportunities for people to share food or snacks or treats uh even if it's just for a few minutes uh, can be uh, also pretty motivating and make people come together and just get out of their work heads for a little while next slide kayla So as Rachel mentioned, um, we want to kind of highlight one additional tool to kind of clo close us off and uh, to, to close us out and um, really pull in all those components of awareness, balance, as well as connection. Um, and for that, we're going to focus on psychological first aid. And I'm curious in the chat with a yes or no, um, is this something you're familiar with? Maybe this is something that you've trained in, yes or no? Psychological first aid. Oh, good. I'm seeing a lot of yeses. Good, good, good. Familiar and trained, fantastic. So really kind of really quickly, um, psychological first aid is an evidence-informed approach to support folks immediately after a disaster or crisis. It's a, it's a tool, but it's a flexible tool that can really be used to respond to and meet a range of reactions and levels of distress uh, with this goal of, of keeping people safe by reducing immediate distress reactions, help with basic needs, and promote personal coping and functioning. Um, and there are different models that have been developed, and we've, we've kind of captured some of those here. Uh, but you may be kind of listening to this and be like, oh, that sounds, that sounds really individual. Uh, but the reason we included this here is because psychological first aid is a tool that can be encouraged and built up within a workforce as really kind of a, a preparedness piece, as well as meeting ongoing um, and emerging uh, stress and stressors that come up within a workforce and a workplace. So that's that's really kind of why we've, we've honed in on this. Um, component in this strategy, kind of tying in, again, those ABCs of awareness, balance, and connection. And it seems like many, many of you are familiar with psychological first aid, as well as some of you are trained in it as well. Um, and there are different models that have been developed, but they do have five common principles across models. And those are uh, safety, this can be physical safety, but it can also be a sense of safety. Connected, uh, connectedness, which really pulls in that social component. Calming, which can help combat symptoms of stress and heightened emotions and distress. Efficacy, pulls in that sense of control. And finally, we have hope. This can be optimism, this can be confidence and, and uh, knowing we can get through a, a crisis or an event. Um, and these are 
principles that are found across models. So now we can kind of look at this and we're going to walk through a, uh, a one model, kind of a, a simple, simplified model of psychological first aid from WHO, which breaks down PFA into three action steps. Can I say one thing, Kayla, as you're getting there? And I think that's the thing when I talk to people about psychological first aid is they sort of have a sense of whether it's a, you know, a pretty involved online long training uh, or an in-person training and it's a five-step process. And we really wanted to say, you know, psychological first aid, it's these principles, but it's not necessarily five steps depending on where you are or what you do. And it can be pretty darn simplified. Uh, and that's why we really like the WHO model because it doesn't require a ton of time or a clinical background to sort of get it very quickly. So Kayla, next slide. Thanks, Rachel. So, yep, yeah, we're gonna walk through the WHO model, which has three action steps. Look, listen, and link. First, starting with look. Um, so this is looking for those in need by really checking are there safety issues? Are there obvious, urgent, basic needs? Um, and really kind of checking in and seeing, are there serious distress reactions? And I, I do wanna recognize that within this group, within this webinar, um, we are coming from a variety of, of in-person, hybrid and, and virtual settings. So I'm curious, what are things that you might look out for in this step when you're thinking about checking for, for distress reactions or basic needs or safety? What are some things that you might look out for or see within your space, regardless if it's virtual, in-person, or hybrid? And I'll, I'll get us started. Rachel actually brought it up earlier, This, at least in a virtual setting. Um, if someone kind of shifts from always being on camera to not being on camera at all, that might be an indication that they're experiencing distress or at least warrant some type of, of follow up or reach out, which I see I see in the chat social withdrawal. Hygiene and state of clothing. Yes, it might be a very kind of visual indication a change in attention, lack of focus and irritability. Rachel, decline too. Else so yeah, I was going to say a decline in uh, in product or in work product. You know, that's just to me. That's I'm I'm always scanning for kind of how are people doing? How engaged are they? How participatory are they? Uh, are they giving me kind of what I what I expect from them? based on what their abilities are and what their previous work uh, product has been like. Thanks, mm -hmm. Kayla. I appreciate that, Rachel. And I think it pulls in, again, that, that awareness piece of many of the responses that you're providing in the chat, you provided earlier when we were going over awareness, so kind of tying it together. So we have look. Next, we have listen. Uh, this is where we listen to help people feel calm and really identify and hear from them. What do they need? What are the concerns? And again, having that calm presence and demeanor. So I'm going to, I'm going to ask again in the chat and then I'll, I'll toss it to Rachel. Actually, if you have an example of this, sure. how do you um, create space for this, like this listening space. How do you kind of create this within your organization and workforce? Well, one of the things that I found really effective is with, for my broader working group, some of whom I supervise, some of whom I don't, they're my peers. Um, I set in regular kind of 15 minute check-in calls. I just say, hey, can we just do a buddy check or a quick check? Because I want to create that space to ask them how they're doing. Um, and the nice thing is, is they'll ask me how I'm doing too, but I am doing that because I'm trying to make sure there is space for somebody to let me know 
they're distressed or they're frustrated or they're losing their motivation or they're feeling burnt out. And I may not have all the answers to that, but just making sure there's opportunities for those conversations uh, and that I'm approachable for those conversations with the folks I do supervise, I think uh, is, is, is how I kind of demonstrate this action step. I, I appreciate in the chat, someone mentioned uh, creating kind of that privacy space as well yeah. when communicating, whether that's closing the door if you're in person or having um, having a private phone conversation or video call if you're virtual. And also, Kayla, just, you know, asking people how they're doing or, or, or can you help me understand what's going on right now? Something that, that allows people the space to say it, say it. I also wanted to reflect on the privacy piece when we're on calls, conference calls, video calls, et cetera. It's really important when you feel like somebody is kind of exhibiting behavior that shows they're under stress or they're not happy or they're frustrated. Take those conversations offline you know, it, it, that privacy piece of not necessarily calling someone out in the middle of a meeting or in public so that uh, it, it sort of makes it less comfortable to sort of be transparent about what your needs are than, than it would to just, after the video's over, the call's over, call them one-on-one, -on -one, email them one-on-one -on -one and, and see what's going on. Mm -hmm. I, I also appreciate in the chat, someone mentioned uh, talking about your own feelings so um, engaging in some kind of self self disclosure as well to normalize that type of conversation and sincerity. So we have look, we now have listen. And next we have link. So for link, this is where you link people to whether it's resources or information. Um, and this can include helping people cope or providing information on um, reactions as well as coping strategies and connecting folks with support, whether that's kind of social support in the, uh, in the workspace or, or groups or organizations, um, it can vary. And I'm, I'm curious, when you look at link and link actions, are there resources or spaces within your own work and your own organization that are kind of your go-to links? Mm -hmm. I see employee assistance program uh, in the chat. Yes, yes. Sharing and knowing and having that information on hand of what is the number for your employee assistance program uh, as well as their website and just a, a brief understanding of, of what is provided within your EAP is incredibly uh, important information to have. So that way you have it at your fingertips. Peer supporters. Rachel, is there anything else you would add here for the link? Sometimes people need to know um, that there's help available from employee relations or uh, there may be the employee assistance program may have information about legal or financial services, uh, retirement planning. Uh, sometimes when we're really listening to what's stressing people out and what they're struggling with, it's kind of tangible, um, more kind of, you know, less emotional needs and more kind of tangible or service needs. Uh, so how can you help them figure out where those uh, resources are? Uh, maybe you know somebody who's been through a similar experience that could you could refer them to to say, hey, you know, I think Martha had something similar happen last year, and I know that she got a lot of assistance for that. You might want to talk to Martha. So this link action doesn't mean you have to become the EAP expert or the expert at all things, but it's just that kind of ability to like, when I'm listening to what people need, what can I, what can get them to the next step? What can get them more information or to help them figure out, okay, here's how I can resolve whatever this stress or concern is that's really affecting my ability to be a contributing team member, a you know, a, an effective worker. Thanks, Kayla.
So the look, listen, link and psychological first aid, these are strategies. These are strategy, strategies that can be integrated and used within organizations for really day-to-day -day activities um, and are, are tools that can be leveraged, especially when teams or organizations are feeling overwhelmed. We can pull components of this uh, into, into our activities to support the workforce. So again, that's that's really why we chose to highlight this, but it doesn't always um, have to look like this. So um, another way we can kind of categorize or, or look at some of these strategies where it's still pulling in on uh, framework pieces of look, listen, link, of those five principal areas of psychological first aid. And if we're kind of thinking that the broader ABCs of building resilience through awareness, balance, and connection, another tool we wanted to highlight here is just, it's a checklist. It's from the Walter Reed Army Institute of Research. And we picked this because it's another way to kind of frame some of this uh, similar information and strategies and frameworks just in a different way. Um, and this is one that has been really well received in a variety of settings. Um, so it is it is titled COVID-19 Leadership Checklist, but if you actually go through, and it's hyperlinked in the title as well, if you go through, the information is really applicable in a variety of settings and it's something that can be used by formal and informal leadership as well as in team settings to really kind of highlight those components of, of connection we see connection again we see um controlling the controllables again um and there are really just wonderful components here that kind of tie it all together which is why we wanted to highlight it rachel is there anything i'm missing here no i think it's uh I just feel like the more of us who are trained, if I work in a place where I know people feel like they know what to do when somebody's not doing well, then I'm more likely to get supported in that organization. And that's why we sort of look at this as kind of a primary prevention strategy. You sort of, if sort of everybody felt like, yeah, I get what look, listen, link is so that they just don't have that moment. And they're like, I don't know what to do if so-and-so seems upset or unengaged or uh, like they're in trouble. Um, starting with a really simple framework like that, which incorporates all of those five elements, the, the principles that, that PFA as a, as a field incorporate. Um, it's just a nice strategy to, to think about implementing um, if, if, you, if, if you have that kind of a workforce. Thanks, Kayla. Oh, and lastly, but not leastly, coming to you from the field, uh, again, we've talked about some of this stuff and you brought it up yourself. I think a lot of people had mentioned that finding that space for humor, laughter uh, and play was very important to them and has become something they really want to continue doing, uh, even as we sort of enter into a different phase of working in the current uh, public health and, and, and sort of world politics environment that we're all in right now. Uh, and that can be doing happy hours, or it could be playing the games we talked about. It could be uh, meeting for breakfast. It, it, it can it can take on a lot of forms, but the idea being, how do we keep it light? Or how do we get it light when it needs to be for a little while? Um, and then things like helping people rotate roles, right? Um, take, the, take a look at kind of what you guys do organizationally, routinely, and how could you change it up a little bit? Maybe have different people lead meetings or... Um, have somebody identify the icebreaker or the motivational saying that, you know, identify someone who's going to get to do that uh, uh, and rotate that. But the idea that people like to take on different roles and they like to see other people in different roles um, just to change stuff up. And it also helps with personal development and growth, which we know is highly linked to the overall feeling of enjoying the workplace. So those are the last ones we're going to bring you from here. Next slide. And we're kind of going to wrap it up right here and give you some time for questions. I'm going to ask Carla, uh, make sure that uh, if you had anything you wanted to add, but uh, if anyone does have a, a burning question that they'd like us to address that they don't feel like we have, you could certainly type it in the chat. And you're also welcome to um, 
write us directly as you have our email addresses uh, at the beginning of the slides, which you'll get in a, in a little bit. But uh, Carla, any, any comments from you? Yeah, well, thank you so much, Rachel and Kayla, for once again, some really useful, practical information and just some things to think about as well. Um, definitely thank you for tying this into psychological first aid. We at IDMH, OMH, and DOH are huge proponents and, and you know, evangelists for PFA. We actually, I don't know if people can actually see this, but um, hey. IDMH developed PFA NY several years ago. So this is kind of our state training curriculum. It was developed with funding from Office of Mental Health. And then for the last several years, the Department of Health has sponsored trainings. First, first I was driving all over the state doing it. Um, <laughs> the last few years have been virtual, but we just wrapped up a series of those trainings, which I'm guessing maybe some people in this audience might have participated in. If so, great. For those who haven't, I am quite sure we'll be doing another round of those PFA trainings again next year, along with another one on um, personal resilience and stress inoculation. So watch the learning management system for announcements of that. We don't have any dates scheduled yet, but I'm sure there will be more out there. And it is absolutely, yeah, very valuable. It's, I sort of think of it as a force multiplier. You know, the more we have people who understand others, why, why people behave the way they do when they are under stress and some very basic things you can do about it. Again, not necessarily requiring a mental health background. Right. Um, that really, really is helpful for sure. So yes, thanks for bringing that up. Appreciate it. Um, I, let's see, looks like someone's asking for your emails. I think we'll distribute all of this after the fact. Um, not seeing any questions coming in. Somebody asked have... about slides and of course, the, the beautiful thing about having federal folks uh, do presentations for you is you've paid uh, for the content that we give you. So they belong to you, not to us. <laughs> um, and yes, yeah, so yes, any of the information you're very, very welcome to use. And if you need our help or clarification on anything, definitely reach out to us. I think our emails are on the first slide, aren't they, Kayla? So yeah, when you get the slide deck, that's where our emails are. And Kayla, I want you to show your one thing real quick before we close. So just just to show that we don't we don't make up these these strategies from the field. This is if it'll focus. This is a framed photo of all the post it out of the box strategies from I think this was the preparedness summit in April. Um, but yeah, so we do use the information. <laughs> that is uh, is shared with us, and we look to it for for inspiration. I love that Kayla framed all those. I think that's great. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. All right. Um, oh, it looks like let's see. One question just came in. So um, I, this is uh, working with with uh, injured workers, um, uh, and they're struggling with workplace due to lack of support, thus leading to less motivation, slower recovery, et cetera. Um, with that kind of um, thing, trying to help people figure out what their part or how they can communicate in a kind of a problem solving way um, with others. Uh, is is kind of the best strategy for that. It is it is a challenge, but I think often people have thought about this. I, I would kind of start with what do you, you know? What have you done, and and how do you think this could be made better? What would have to happen, or what would have to change, and then try and kind of unpack that into something that's actually actionable. Because sometimes it does seem too big. It's like I need a whole different boss, or I need. It, it seems really big. But trying to unpack what the what the changes that's needed or what would facilitate at least feeling better about the support, um, and and starting understanding kind of what they've already done or what they've already tried because I think we often jump that step, and it's important to know what what happened there and and what maybe worked what didn't. So it's kind of the best case. But the other thing I would say is if you go to the Center for the Study of Traumatic Stress, they have a lot of nice workplace kind of related um, resources and information that you might find something in there that's useful. Kayla, I know you've been out there online a lot. Do you have anything else you wanted to uh, contribute for this one? Um, I would just add that, especially for the assessment piece, if there's already been a 
kind of like a workplace survey or assessment, um, or if not, if that if that's feasible, um, and really looking at like for workplace surveys and assessments, that's great. Uh, that's a great way to get information, but it's also a way to kind of categorize next steps in terms of okay, how do you actually use this information? If you find X Y Z for a an overwhelmed or or struggling workplace, kind of picking out the specifics and then that'll help inform more concrete strategies. Okay. All right. Thank you for that hopeful, hopefully helpful response. Um, and we are out of time, so I will just wrap things up. So thank you so much, Rachel Call and Kayla Seavey for yet another thoughtful and genuinely helpful training. Um, on behalf of our partners in this event, Tom Henry of State Department of Health and Steve Moskowitz of State Office of Mental Health. Um, we really want to thank everyone in the audience. As, as Rachel said at the beginning, we know it's hard to make the time to attend these kinds of things. So we hope that they made it worth your while um, and you got some really useful skills from this. Um, and thanks also just for you know all of the work that you have been doing through our very challenging recent past. I know it's really been a strain for everybody. So again, we hope the webcast has given you ideas for how to keep yourself and your organization going as we continue to figure out how to work in a sustainable uh, manner. So Rachel and Kayla, Maybe we can have you back next year, and it will really be the post-pandemic. <laughs> uh, oh, <I'm> totally new. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks everyone. We appreciate your time. We appreciate your work, and uh, we will see you in future events. I'm sure. All right, thank thanks. you everybody. Appreciate Take it. Take care.